ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is uh, Avi Urban. Thanks very much for attending our presentation on the COVID-19 impact on Silicon Valley real estate. Uh, I hope this your time will be well spent. Uh, before we dive into the details, and there will be a lot of details, uh, I want to take a second and enjoy this view with you. This is a view of um, Santa Clara County from Rancho San Antonio, looking at the Bay Area, and we can see uh, the Moffett Field, we can see Palo, uh, Palo Alto, uh, Stanford University, that's actually Moffett Field also. And the reason I'm bringing this one up is that uh, I live, my wife and I live in Silicon Valley for the last 35 years. Uh, so I love Silicon Valley. Um, Silicon Valley is, uh, is a very interesting place of a lot of opportunities as well as challenges for quite few. And at the same time, we have the benefit of, uh, beside uh, benefiting from living in this pro prosperous area, also have a quick access to beautiful parks that I personally, and obviously my wife as well, enjoy very much hiking in those uh, places and kind of uh, decompress of uh, daily uh, challenges and so on. So, uh, starting by counting our blessing, we have a beautiful weather, a lot of uh, business opportunities and of challenges as well, of course, but nevertheless, as a whole, I love the area and I really believe in its long-term uh, prospects. Um, as far as the agenda of our presentation, we're gonna be uh, talking, taking a few minutes to discuss uh, uh, some general stuff. We'll talk about, uh, we have a, a kind of five segment in our presentation. The first one is uh, uh, what was the baseline of Silicon Valley prior to the COVID-19? Uh, we'll talk about uh, the market during COVID-19. We'll talk about prior crisis, particularly two ones back in 2000, the dot-com crash and the financial crisis in 2007. And not that uh, that is something which will repeat itself in the same format, but what can we learn from that uh, events and what can be applied for the future? We'll talk about what can we expect of the impact of this crisis on the Silicon Valley economy and the real estate market. Uh, finally, I'll share with you what are my recommendation, my beliefs, and we'll basically go from there. Uh, as far as uh, structurally, for each of those segments, we're gonna take about uh, between, as, I'm, uh, as we mentioned, between 15 minutes plus minus to discuss them. By the end of each section, we will uh, have a five minutes Q and A. The end, we're gonna have another uh, five, 10 minutes, as long as people are gonna stay online and be interested in the conversation to ask questions. And on top of that, at the end of the presentation, uh, we will follow up with uh, a link to uh, the recorded webinar. Anyone who wants and interested to receiving a copy or link to this recorded webinar, please enter in your chat box, a personal uh, message to, the, to Asav, the uh, monitor, with your name and email address, so we can send it to you and hopefully you will be able to benefit from the recording. So you don't have to take necessarily uh, notes right now, you can focus entirely on the presentation. And the last part will be talking about what are the next step. So, a uh, few words about ourselves. Uh, <clears throat> I've been uh, doing real estate since uh, 2005. We are lucky to have uh, other members in our group, uh, Asaf, Ella, uh, Nati, and Amit. Uh, each one of them is uh, helping us in different areas of our business. Uh, overall, we are uh, providing those uh, services to our client. Um, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, as far as our uh, life in Silicon Valley, where Yael, my, my wife and I arrived, in December 1st, 1985 to Silicon Valley. 
uh, we were very fortunate. We have actually did uh, plenty of uh, real estate transaction in Silicon Valley and in various areas, other areas of the country. And uh, we are very happy with our transaction so far. We'll see how the future will be, but in general, we are happy with that. And um, one of the things that I'm most proud of is the kind of reviews that we are getting from our uh, clients. Everyone is welcome to, and I would encourage any new clients that have not worked with us to take a few minutes uh, and um, review our uh, our uh, review uh, feedbacks or testimonial. And anyone who is planning to work with someone else, I would encourage them to make sure they do their due diligence on the partner they choose before they commit to one. Uh, what uh, the way we define ourselves uh, as holistic realtors compared to transactional realtors, and what that does basically means that we do not view our relationship with our clients as only help you buy or sell your Silicon Valley home, but we look at basically establishing a long term relationship that may start with helping you buy or sell your Silicon Valley home, but continues. Uh, into the realm of uh, investing in the real estate uh, portfolio, establish, helping you establish your building your net value, as well as your passive income for retirement. And of course, uh, any one of my, our clients, you know, many clients always have questions about uh, contractors, about uh, refinancing, about trust issues associated with their real estate holding and so on. And obviously we are here for them to help them. So holistic versus transactional, and that's what we are uh, differentiating ourselves and proud about the services we provide to our clients. Now, I also want to invite you to our next week uh, introduction to real estate investing. Those people who have not uh, made investment yet in real estate, we would like to introduce them to this uh, class, uh, investment class. We talk in general about why everyone should be investing. Obviously, we talk about um, uh, why in real estate, what are the benefits, what are the drawbacks, and so on. And I want to say something in general. Uh, this, uh, my honest uh, objective of this presentation and any conversation which we have with our client is to be very honest with you and factual. We do not try to hype the market. We try to be objective. We trust that we are dealing with intelligent people and we want to provide you our experience and expertise so you can make the right decision for yourself. We don't, we won't push you. We will not hype them any situation. We want to make sure that you are fully aware of the advantages and disadvantages of whatever decision you decide to make. So with that, uh, we're going to now start with actually the focus of our presentation, and that is the COVID-19 impact on uh, Silicon Valley economy and the real estate market. And there is nothing better to start by actually start talking about the timeline. Uh, it came obviously um, whether we were the reason why uh, only one can ask, how come we only went into the, the COVID, the, the shelter in place in um, February 25. Uh, was, uh, and that, that's, that discussion gonna continue probably for quite some time. What did we miss? What could we have done better and so on? But with all that putting aside, uh, let's give the credit where it's due to San Francisco mayor who actually, and her team, I, I would imagine, who basically declare shelter in place the first in the country. So I think with this fact, we can see with, even though that California is the most populous state in the country with approximately 40 million people, the unfortunate number of people who actually have passed away and each one of them is, is a life by its own and, and all that and family and, uh, and so on. Nevertheless, though, compared to the size of the state, we, our uh, death rate and hospitality rate is relatively uh, uh, small compared to other places in the country. Following uh, San Francisco, the Bay Area declared it uh, shelter in place back in uh, March of 16. Uh, California as a whole declared it a few days later. 
the United States was short and lagging. And as you can see, even though we know that the US is more than 45 states, only 45 states actually declare that. You can argue whether it was a good decision or bad decision, time will tell, vis-a-vis -vis actually also the Swedish experience and see wh whether that was a right decision or not. That's not the objective of our presentation today. Uh, <clears throat> real estate was added to essential services uh, in uh, April or 3rd of April, and we're gonna see some uh, impact on that on the market. Um, and back in uh, this week, uh, California government, governor, declared uh, on um, California start relaxing those uh, shelter in place uh, restriction and not it does not apply to the entire state as a whole but <clears throat> segment of California obviously the big question is uh, will we going to see a reoccurrence in the fall I'm sure many of you heard uh, <clears throat> some cautious uh, warning for particularly from Dr. Fauci and their team about the uh, convergence of the flu season with the reoccurrence of the coronavirus. So these are some of the obviously the unknown. So that's going to set up the background of what are we doing here in terms of timeline and so on. So let's now start going into the impact of the Silicon Valley uh, uh, economy on the real estate market. But uh, before we dive into that, uh, <clears throat> I want to take a minute and first of all, what is Silicon Valley? More than uh, actually a real physical place, Silicon Valley is more of a state of mind than really an exact physical place. But nevertheless though, when we're talking about Silicon Valley, what do we really mean? So first of all, <clears throat> Silicon Valley as we know it today, uh, is five counties. And I'm mentioning today because when I arrived to Silicon Valley back in 1985, Silicon Valley was considered to be only Santa Clara Valley or county. And what we're seeing today that it definitely expanded beyond what is the Santa Clara County. And it includes particularly most vividly San Francisco, which ed was added recently with the flood of startup and new um, young uh, high tech professional moving to the city and so on. So <clears throat> in addition to the physical place, we can, uh, we are discussing four employment hubs and these are the San Francisco, Peninsula, South Bay and East Bay. And we also look at our economy not as a homogeneous economy and that is a very important component because as you go, as we move forward in the presentation, you're going to see that the different economies play a critical role on obviously on the economy as well as on the real estate market. So the most critical economy that we have in Silicon Valley is the established innovation industry. And we have roughly, we have something which I'm going to touch in a few minutes about SV150, which is the 150 largest publicly traded company center headquarters in Silicon Valley. I'll touch it in a minute. But number one is the innovation, established innovation company. And obviously you, most of you, if not all of you are always familiar with those names. Then we have the startup innovation industry. This is an industry which is basically always kind of the future of Silicon Valley. The new technologies that we have seen from uh, the famous Google and Facebook and so on, which basically always fuels the next round of innovation in our area. And of course, we have the support industries from government, healthcare, retail, food, and so on. These are all essential industries in our age region because without them, we cannot have a normal life, okay? We cannot live without having doctors, teacher, fire uh, people, policemen, and so on. These are essential industry but I call it a support because really what drives our area are these two industries and the rest of the industry, the rest of them uh, uh, industries here are typically to support that kind of, that's, that's uh, the established industry and innovation industry in general. So if we look at the area in general, okay, if we look at this area, what do we see here? 
it's our area in terms of size, in terms of population, uh, in terms of jobs, okay, average annual earning. When we look at this kind of number compared to the US, which is roughly about 60,000 plus minus, we see that definitely uh, this is an area with a lot of potential earning. And obviously we also actually also see that uh, the cost of living is obviously very high. Another interesting part is these two elements, okay? This is the, the net foreign immigration and net domestic migration. Uh, we see more and more that this area is becoming an area with a very homogeneous uh, demographics, which is typically very highly educated people, very young people, high income. And we see, unfortunately, a lot of people who are probably born in this area, born and raised in area, cannot uh, live uh, or stay here because the cost of living is so, so high. So this is the one of the unfortunate thing that we do see in our area. So Silicon, Silicon Valley uh, is prosperous and decline as a function of how well the local innovation based companies are doing. And that is a very, very important thing. Okay. Very important. Uh, we cannot continue to maintain this uh, lifestyle if it would not be for those high tech company that are generating incredible amount of revenue in our area. There is absolutely uh, no question about it. <clears throat> what I like to, what I believe in general and follow as a consequence is that the Silicon Valley real estate is a derivative of the local economy. And as such, basically, I believe that the leading indicator that we have to follow is not when we are trying to understand what's going to happen in Silicon Valley real estate is actually business indicator like the Silicon Valley 150, which I, as I mentioned, those the, indica the index that for the largest company located headquarters in Silicon Valley. And when we're looking at the startup industry, we have to follow the other elements of the of, uh, of the leading indicator for the startup industry from the joint venture Silicon Valley IPO to VCL angel funding, M&A, and all that kind of stuff. This is for me was and is the leading indicator when I'm trying to understand what's going to happen in the near future and long-term future in the Silicon Valley real estate. And as such, I want to share with you uh, some of those kind of incredible, impressive numbers that we are experiencing here in Silicon Valley. Okay. So what do we see here? We see here that as far as I'm going to have an updated, this is a 218, this is a 218 uh, number. Um, and what I want to share with you is that, uh, even though we're talking about 150 publicly traded companies, 20% of those companies are responsible for almost 85% of the revenue of Silicon Valley. Okay. 20 companies are responsible for 85% of the Silicon Valley gross revenue. And what we're looking at, if we look at here at the bottom here, okay, we see that Silicon Valley top 20 companies are generating about 880, almost let's call it $885 billion of revenue. And these are 18 numbers. The numbers for 19, I've not, I've not finished doing the summary, but they are at least 10% to 15% higher. Compared to the US, the generating 20 trillion, 20 and a half trillion in 18, we are generating about 800 and almost 900 billion, almost a trillion dollar which we, is basically 4% of the uh, GDP of the United States. And something which I'm sure some of you know, California is, if California was, would be an independent state, it would be the sixth number uh, largest economy in the world. If Silicon Valley was an independent state, it would be the 17th largest economy in the world. And if we look at those numbers compared to number of employees, so 0.75% of, Population is generating almost four and a half, four percent. If we further 
if we are looking not only the top 20, but we're looking at the entire 150 companies, we are seeing that we're generating 1.1 trillion, which is about 5.4 of the uh, gross GDP of the United States. And that even not, this is not even, ex this is excluding the fact that we're not counting about $52 billion of startup money. And we do not look at companies which are headquarters uh, in outside of Silicon Valley, whether it's Amazon, Microsoft, Samsung, and so on. So the bottom line here is Silicon Valley is an incredible engine of innovation and growth and a significant economy that is not, second to none in the world. One of, so the leading, if we're going back to the leading indicator that I mentioned before, and the reason I'm looking at the stock market as a leading indicator, because anyone who follows the stock market knows that basically in general, analysts and do not care about how the companies perform in the past. They care about what is the forecast for the companies to perform in the future. So that is why I'm looking at tracking the stock market of those companies as an aggregated, as the Silicon Valley 150, as an early indicator, leading indicator of how our region will perform. So if we look at this chart uh, uh, from a beginning of roughly beginning of February, before the corona uh, crisis hit us, we see a very significant growth. And what we see here that you see the Silicon Valley companies are outperforming the S&P 500. And those who are not familiar with the S&P 500, which is basically um, the index for the largest 500 companies in on the US stock market. Uh, one thing which you should not forget, so very much we see here that the Silicon Valley companies are outperforming the stock market. Something which we also, shouldn't forget is the fact that actually the S&P 500 is actually has about 23% of in its index high tech company, which is uh, a lot of them are Silicon Valley companies. Some of them are not, of course, like IBM and Microsoft, which are not based in Silicon Valley, but nevertheless though, are benefiting from the technology, whether it's IBM and Microsoft and Amazon, they are part of the index, but they are not local here, but they are basically giving us the trend. So in other words, what we're seeing here, that the technology actually, not that it's outperforming only the S&P 500, but it actually helps lift the SPY, the S&P 500. And we clearly see that the market see this industry as an industry which is significant, as a significant impact on our economy or on our economy on the future. And, and when we move now to the startup industry, to the innovation industry, the next generation, the future, the future of Silicon Valley in terms of innovation, of course, not all innovation gonna be only in startup. We know that Apple, Google, Facebook, and other companies and Tesla and so on are continue to innovate. There's no question about that. But nevertheless, though, this is an industry which is has a, not a, a uh, has a significant part in our economy, and obviously we have to look at that. So what we see here, this is um, from uh, the uh, index 220, basically it looks at uh, 2019, and what we see here, venture capital investment, we see that venture capital investment actually start dropping already last year from the previous year. If we look now at uh, uh, angel investment, which typically is a more higher risk investment, where we do uh, see a um, smaller amount, nevertheless, those uh, companies that are early stages, we also see some downward trends also starting from previous year. And obviously we see actually from a year earlier, a little bit also um, a, a reduced uh, investment level. So if we look at early seed investment, we have seen, we see for quite a few years that early stage startup is dropping uh, and it started many, about five years earlier. We see some of those angel investments picking some of that market share, but nevertheless, though, we do see that dropping. So we see here also that uh, uh, IPO, we see that the IPO is actually going down. If you see that, it's going down. 
Uh, so obviously IPO are critical for the venture industry to have liquidity and being able to invest in future startup. And another, which is interesting though, what we see here that um, M&A is going up. Basically companies are some, because of IPO, obviously the reason why IPO is going down because you see a more a, a m and transaction and we see a steady growth of that, what's actually happening in this business. So let's now take a look at wh where we are with our employment. So what we see here, this is another very important chart and it basically look at the general employment of Silicon Valley and Silicon Valley basically looks at our employment in three tiers, okay? We see the tier one, which is basically, this is tier one, uh, tier one, which is basically the high skill uh, employees, high skills, high wages. We have tier two, which is basically uh, uh, the, the, the red one. And these are, see the largest one, tier two, mid skill, mid level, and uh, low skill level, tier three. So I want you to, uh, and we're gonna come back to this chart to make sure that you see how those if, uh, employment level fluctuate over time and are impacted by uh, the different uh, economic cycle that Silicon Valley is going through. So uh, now we're gonna talk about uh, the prior to COVID-19, the real estate. Let's talk about the real estate market prior to COVID-19. So what do we see here? This chart shows us uh, the Santa Clara for the Santa Clara County median price and, uh, and average price. And I like to follow those, the median price and average price as a long-term trend. Obviously, and we're gonna discuss a little bit down the road, uh, it does not give you a good indication of uh, a particular area that you might be interested in buying. Uh, because obviously you do not buy in the median or average prices in Silicon Valley, you buy in a particular neighborhood that fits your profile needs and so on. But nevertheless, the medium gives us some kind of a direction of what's happening in the market. So we have the average and the medium. And obviously the reason we have such a discrepancy between average and medium, because we can find homes in Santa Clara County that are maybe priced at 500 to $800,000 on one hand, and then we go into areas like Palo Alto, Los Altos, uh, Woodside and um, Atherton and so on, where you can buy homes for 15, 20, 30 millions and above. So obviously we do see a discrepancy between these two. Another thing that I want you to look at there, which is very important, is the fact that a lot of the appreciation typically happens in the first quarter. Okay, if you look at here, you look here, you look here, there is a sort of a trend of the market. Appreciation, most of the appreciation from a timing perspective is happening in the Q1, Q2, and then kind of the market flattens. Okay, so watch that. As we move now, as we move now to uh, the sell volume. So the blue one, okay, this is, this is, this is the supply and this is the sales. Okay. And what we see when we follow the market, that the market has some cycles in it. Okay. Is you look at that, obviously we have here the low, this is the low inventory and low number of sin. Inventory picks up tower the summer, drops back again tower the next uh, end of the year. And this kind of pattern keeps repeating itself. Okay. And if we look at what happened back in 2019, 18, if you remember in the Q4 of 2018, the feds have started increasing the, the interest rate, increasing the interest rate. And what we saw is basically a drop in the, uh, uh, in the sales while we saw an increase in the, in the inventory. And we see that actually increase going to the beginning of next year. And if we look at the prices, what happened, we see the appreciation here but clearly we see the drop in the prices at the end of uh, uh, 2018. And we saw some pickup at the beginning, but, and again, in the flat. So basically we see that the market has cycles, which are basically depends on the time of the year, 
but we also clearly see the dependency between prices, interest rate, basically the affordability of people to purchase a home in their target area. And obviously, when we look at uh, another indicator, which is basically the relation between the sales price to lease price, we saw here a major drop. This is a 2018 where major drop we see in the uh, relationship between sales price to list price. And we saw the beginning of 19, which we're going to talk in a few minutes, is a pickup. And I can tell you that our the beginning of 2019 was a very strong beginning for us. We saw our the year started between January and kind of middle of end of February. We've seen a very strong start. We went into a lot of transaction. We have seen competition. We've seen prices going up and so on. Definitely, no question about it. And as we look at the basically the uh, uh, a ratio that we are tracking kind of seller market versus buyer's market so again 2019 we start seeing market is moving toward in favor of buyers but then we also saw the market is basically moving back in favor of sellers okay so what we want to look now at is the affordability affordability is a critical parameters that measure the relationship between the median income to median price house, a given a cost of capital at about 20% on a 30 years loan. This is, this is an indicator that gives us again a general trend. It's not really fully accurate and applicable for everyone because one of the things that this uh, uh, index affordability index is not taking into account is the fact that not necessarily every person who lives in the county is in the is a, in the market to buy a home. A more accurate index would have been one that actually measured the affordability of those people who are in the market. Okay, so not people necessarily who are retirees or are in the early. Uh, uh, career, but what is the affordability rate of those who are really in the market to buy a home? And I believe, and obviously this uh, ratio is much higher because if you, if anyone of you uh, is aware of any of the uh, requirements to obtain a loan these days, they will, then it will be very clear to them that most of the banks would not lend you a money if your debt to income ratio is above 43%. So basically, the, there is some discrepancy to that, but the actual lending actually would not allow you to, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the, the lender would not lend you money unless you're uh, for the particular house, a particular down payment, if your debt to ratio is over 40%. So what do we see here? So we have here obviously the San Mateo County, we have the Santa Clara County, and what we hear here today, interesting enough, as we see here in this area, that our affordability went up. So how in the world can that be if we know that prices are where they are uh, and uh, not, nobody, as I am aware of, has received an, a, a major pay raise in the, in a very short time? So the explanation for that is very simple. What we have seen, we have seen, as of, if you remember, uh, 2018 that we talked about where interest rates went consistently up and basically this is December 24 when the feds reduced the rates and it dropped from <clears throat> about five plus to roughly where we are today around three to three and a quarter and if we talk about uh, adjustable rate mortgage we are already touching 2.5 2.6 so clearly the main factor that helped this kind of recovery that we're seeing here is the fact that interest rate were reduced significantly. So, on the demand side, obviously this is the supply side. Now let's talk about the demand side. So what we're seeing here that we still have a very strong demand. So if you look at this uh, chart that basically follow the relationship between increase in jobs, okay, 
to increase in uh, available housing. And this gap is basically shows us the shortage, the, 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 the shortfall of the available housing that is available in the area. So obviously the larger that gap is, the more there is a demand. And what we're gonna see very shortly that that is actually um, depends on various cities. So if we look at that part, look at San Jose compared to San Francisco that has a very significant uh, gap. And we move to Sunnyvale also a significant and Santa Clara, they also have a significant one and we go to Redwood City and so on. So we see a lot of those areas that we have here have a, a strong demand and the demand, obviously not everyone who moves and start working in this area is in the market, but nevertheless though, you see clearly that there is a strong demand for housing in our area. So yes, not necessarily everyone is looking to buy a house, but everyone has to live somewhere. So it's either this demand is for new housing, whether you buy one or you have to rent one. That is clearly an indication. And if we look at other cities that we have here, Menlo Park also, we have a significant impact and we look at Los Altos and so on. And I want you to look, remember the, the cities, Saratoga, Los Altos, Palo Alto, Cupertino, Sunnyvale. When we're gonna talk about another element of who are the people gonna be impacted in, in different areas, okay? given the tier one, tier three that we spoke about. So we're gonna get back to that a little bit later. So in summary, uh, this first segment, the Silicon Valley real estate, uh, uh, sil sorry, Silicon Valley economy and real estate market prior to uh, COVID-19. So what, what can, how can I summarize it? Economy performed very well. We have seen the index that as we talked about as the leading indicator for myself, as a very strong indication of what's happening in the market. We have startup funding was trending downwards already before, before the COVID-19. So that's, uh, we're gonna see down in a few slides that it actually has just accelerated. We see a real estate market respond to a strong tailwind, okay? From high stock market, lower interest rate and low inventory. These are the three factor, stock prices, interest rate, low inventory, resulting obviously in higher buyer interest, more competition, high, higher sale price to list price. Uh, and obviously uh, these are the result of that. Nevertheless though, there are, and there have been already for quite some time, people who believe that Silicon Valley and the financial market was in a bubble. In my typical, in our typical seminar, I ask, I have a segment of what is a bubble I spend more time in that and uh, I will be more than happy to take it offline or when we talk more about in the seminar, more detail, I'll be able to share it. But in general, uh, the, the question of bubble, whether it is a bubble or not bubble is not a simple one. And I can tell you that prior to the prior COVID-19, in my humble opinion, based on this criteria, which I'll be happy to share with anyone, is that I do not believe that Silicon Valley was in a bubble at least not at that time. And with that, I would like to open it for about five minutes of uh, Q&A. Please uh, ask questions, open your mics, and I'm here to answer any question you have. Avi, uh, what, is the, what is the impact of the tax changes from 2018 on the demand? Excellent question. Uh, we basically, obviously the Trump tax uh, uh, was not as significant impact as many have thought it will. It impact particularly our area because for two factors. Number one, they excluded uh, the deduction of property taxes uh, for people who are making certain money, number one. Number two, they reduced the deductible interest on mortgages up to $750,000. Number three, they removed the deduction of $100,000 deduction of a home equity line of credit. So those factors, eliminating the uh, property tax basically, or actually limiting it to $10,000, including state and local taxes, uh, reducing the deductible of interest, which we used to be until $1 million to 
uh, 750 and the elimination of the home equity line of credit had an impact, but much less than we anticipated. So we see we saw some slow market during the 18 uh, 18 19, but we saw a very strong pickup in the beginning of 19. Next question. Questions? Asaf, are there any questions on the? Yeah, I, have a, I, have, I have a question. Yes, please. Okay, I was uh, noticing that the uh, sales to listing uh, ratio uh, spiked between about mid 17 and mid 2018. Can you explain that? And um, can we expect something else like that in the future? Well, uh, obviously, the the anytime we see a spike in the ratio between a list price and sell price, it can come from a few factors. Number one, which is the least one that I like, is when agents are underpricing the house below fair market value. There are quite a few agents that are basically underpricing the homes and sometimes 20, 30 percent below fair market value. And they do that because they want to create some um, uh, uh, rush. They want to create competition and they basically are not pricing in the fair market value, giving the illusion to some people that uh, to, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a steal and you should jump to that. That's that's one of the ugly part of this business, which I don't appreciate very much. The other explanation to that is, uh, which is a, a genuine one, which is that we see consistently a drop in the volume of homes offered to sell. At the same time, we see, and we saw before, an increase in the demand, coupled with the fact that we have people working in the high-tech business and their stocks are doing very well, and the fact that the interest rate dropped, so we see a demand uh, basically coupled with affordability that's created that kind of a competition. Uh, was that a? Yeah, I think uh, I think so. I'm just not quite sure why it happened between mid seventeen and mid eighteen specifically. Um, was there some trigger, or an interest rate change, or? Yeah, there are some parameters we can dive deep into that, but that typically what's happening. Thank you. Uh, next question. I'll ask another one. Um, I've heard some crazy talk about interest rates uh, dropping like crazy and, uh, you know, special uh, loans being given uh, due to the pandemic. Um, do you think there's anything to that? And, uh, we're going to talk, uh, we're going to talk about interest rate a little bit uh, later, but actually uh, today lending is becoming much more complex than it ever was before. Uh, we're going to see, uh, and we're going to talk in the during section on about that. So I'll talk a little bit more about it la later on, if you don't mind. Thank you. Okay. So last question before we move to the next segment. You can type in the chat if you'd like to. Oh, I have a question Please. about uh, the affordability, like. Uh, was can you explain more about the meaning of that? Like we saw a percentage there, but is that um, average income and average? Very good question. Right. Thank you. Yeah. So what? First of all, let's define affordability. Affordability is the relationship between the median income to the median house price, uh, taking into account the cost of capital, which twenty percent down for a thirty years loan. So if they look at the median income in the county, for instance. And they, then they look at the median price house and they know what's the interest rate. And they say, with 20% down, given today's interest rate, how, what is the percentage of people who can afford buying the median house price? I see, what's uh, with the debt to income rate? So it's the ratio, it's a ratio between house price to an income given the cost of capital. So the higher the number, it means that more people can afford buying. The lower the number is less people can afford buying. But what I also said that that is why it gives us a general indication of the market. It's not telling you a true story because there, what we have to measure is the affordability 
of the people who are in the market and buying, not necessarily people who are retirees and don't make any money anymore or basically just graduated from school and start working. So the, it gives you, though, a general indication of the ability of the local population to participate in the real estate market, given those financial conditions. The Silicon Valley uh, real estate market during COVID-19, okay? And as you see here, I basically, this is, uh, this is uh, the last data that I uh, compile is from 5.7, uh, okay? So what is the market saying about the Silicon Valley? And every time I talk about the Silicon Valley real estate, I always start with what is the Silicon Valley economy? Because as I mentioned before, and I will repeat myself a few times probably this uh, presentation, is that the Silicon Valley real estate market is a derivative of the local economy, okay, period. There is, it's not because we have beautiful land, country, the landscape is beautiful, we have great weather, we have good schools, uh, there, there's limited land and so on. That's all secondary. The primary factors impacting the real estate market is the local economy, period. So, what does the market tell us about the local economy? And as I, I indicated before, for me, it's basically looking at those uh, SV150 and the local companies, how they perform in this market. So, obviously, this is the correction that happened back in uh, end of February last year, we see a major correction that took place. And ever since we see a, a major recovery and look carefully what it actually shows us. It shows us that the Silicon Valley companies, the, the 100, uh, the, the largest companies and particularly the 20th largest company, they already have recovered their losses. Okay. They recovered the losses while the S&P is still lagging. And the S&P is still lagging, even though that it gets a lift from the technology component in the S&P 500. So basically what that tells me is that the market views those high tech companies as the one that gonna, they're gonna be hurt. There's no question in my mind that those companies are gonna be hurt. But nevertheless though, they will be part of the recovery and success of the future economy that we're gonna be participating post the COVID-19, whenever that's gonna happen. And we look when we look at the employment in Silicon Valley, let me just remove that stuff. The next factor, which is the employment status of the innovation industry, and we'll talk both about the startup as well as the other industries. We obviously, this is from April 7, this article, Bay Area is hiring crumbles, okay? More companies also report they will uh, contemplate layoffs, okay? This is something which I basically from, uh, I, this is from an interview with uh, 95, uh, there is something called here the uh, Silicon Valley Leadership Council, and that's basically, uh, it's a poll of Silicon Valley, 350, uh, the, in this group of uh, Silicon Valley CEO, there's about 350 people across multiple industries. And in the last survey that was published uh, on 5.7 uh, a few days ago, 95 of the 350 CEO of Silicon Valley responded to, this, uh, to the question about hiring. And as you can see here, we see here 32 people are, 3.2% uh, 3, 3 are basically talking about layoff. We see another percentage already doing layoff. So we basically see about 15% of Silicon Valley CEOs are already engaged in layoff. A very dramatic change from the previous study when business as usual, two weeks ago, roughly two weeks ago to three weeks ago, 61% of Silicon Valley CEO that responded to the survey said that they expect to see business as usual. The new update dropped from 61 to, to almost 16%, a significant drop to the business as usual. And obviously we also see here that uh, hiring is only essential and hiring frozen is a significant of the market. So clearly we see the sign, the first signs 
of Silicon Valley companies are starting to basically uh, uh, put the brakes on on hiring. Okay, so if we move forward, this is uh, an article that uh, we saw back in also April 9, 800,000 Bay Area jobs may be lost. California uh, faces nearly 4 million job losses, and that was back in April 19. As we look at that, what's the highlight of this article? A Bay Area expected to lose a significant number of people, various areas, different jobs, Santa Clara, 204 jobs, uh, San Francisco, and so on and so forth, different areas, different impact. The great economic spend would be hit by middle to low income uh, segment of the market, which are already been struggling for quite some time. As, and that is also a very important fact is that Santa Clara will probably have the best economic performance in the state's tech oriented economy is more resistant to other industry. Also very important thing when we are kind of bring it back to real estate, Bay Area economy, job market are headed for a significant rebound. And we're gonna see whether that's gonna happen or not. I'm a little bit more skeptical about it. And also the article that was published by the CEO survey is also a little bit skeptic about that. And we're gonna see prior crisis that it took a little bit longer for Silicon Valley than a summer to recover from the jobs. But nevertheless, that's what the article says. And um, also this is actually an article from uh, Friday that actually it's kind of almost a month later and they already, while we already have 4 million jobs lost in California, we see that that pace of job loss is slowing down. So that's kind of a good news. Okay, 4 million lost their job, but the pace of losses is slowing down. Uh, one of those article uh, a month ago, Tesla plans furloughs and pay cuts. And the reason I'm, I'm uh, actually highlighting the pay cuts is, and if you look at below there, exact salaries can drop by 30% and non-essential stop kills healthcare. So basically, if we go back to the affordability and back to how lenders are looking at how much money they are willing to lend you, the moment your income drops, obviously your buying power is dropping as well. So that is for exact. I don't know what's gonna happen for the rest of there and different industry, but definitely from my conversation with other colleagues and clients who are in the high tech business, we definitely hear clearly there are um, job cuts and uh, forced uh, vacation, uh, talks about uh, reducing their RSU allocation and all that kind of stuff. So we definitely see that those um, uh, that has implication on Silicon Valley across the board. Uh, obviously, we see here uh, uh, Yelp is laying off people as well as furloughs. We say uh, we see here uh, something which is not only the layoffs, pay cuts, hitting more white collar jobs, doctors, uh, office, law firms, and so on. So we see that this pain is not only. Uh, in the tier three, tier two people, but also in the tier one employment. We see that across the board. It's not only um, limited to tier two and three. GoPro is uh, laying off people. Uh, Airbnb cut 25% of their workforce. Uh, Uber has 3,700 uh, people and so on. And what we see here, published here in the, in the, on la last week is uh, in our particular area, we see uh, 74,000 only in April timeframe. And if we look at the industry that were impacted, we see hotels, okay? We see hotels, we see um, distributors, we see Goodwill, we see restaurants, and we see here uh, another hotel, and we see some high-tech companies, okay? That's high-tech companies here but they're talking more about furloughs versus layoffs. So we do see that uh, this is going across the board. It's not limited to tier two and tier three industries. And this is something, and the kind of companies that we will see in the high tech sector, which gonna be impacted, these are tech companies that are involved in the, what I call the consumer-based uh, economy. Whether it's the Yelp, Groupon, Toast, Expedia, 
uh, Traviago Travel Restaurants and so on. These are the companies that are going to be impact, even though they are in high tech, but their consumers, uh, their clients are serving the consumer, which is two thirds of the economy. So obviously when we see uh, levels of 33 plus millions people uh, unemployed, it obviously going to have impact on the entire economy as well on the Silicon Valley high tech industry. The industry in Silicon Valley, which is most susceptible to be impacted by that, is the companies that are treating or um, catering to the consumer based economy, unlike the back end economy. We have seen numbers from Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Oracle, Salesforce, and so on that are actually have performed relatively well. So, if we look at another uh, uh, published joint venture Silicon Valley, again, these are all resources that many of you can benefit and by tracking. And what we see uh, uh, impact on uh, hiring, unemployment, and commercial space, and so on. So, what are the highlights of those articles? Okay, since March, we see local startup laid off 17K employees. Okay, a significant number. Funding is far more challenging that it has been in many years and many could fail as a result. Okay, so we see in the high tech segment in the startup industry, there will be quite casualties and we already have seen a significant casualty. And by the way, in this uh, CNBC uh, published uh, interview, there is a talk about 44,000 across the world startup business industry is shedding uh, employees. Um, what we also see a very interesting one, established tech companies business is even busier uh, than before and people around the world lean heavily on social media. This is a very important factor and part of the reason I'm uh, cautiously optimistic about Silicon Valley in general is that we live today in a world which depends more and more about technology and who better than Silicon Valley is basically suited to benefit from that kind of uh, uh, resurgence of dependence on it. Nevertheless, there is some interesting implication for this kind of new world and obviously it depends how long it's gonna last, is the fact that what we are seeing that we are realizing that more and more people can work remotely. So obviously enabled by technologies which were developed locally, but what's the impact? What's the impact on Silicon Valley here when people don't necessarily have to live in Silicon Valley? Okay. Obviously we have impact on commercial real estate and residential real estate. Uh, do we really need all those offices? As I'm sure many of you are aware, Google is investing heavily and in Facebook in Google Village, um, Willow Village, Apple is investing a lot of real estate in Silicon Valley. How will that new world gonna impact commercial real estate? How much of this world will basically impact the fact that people don't necessarily have to live here? Will we, will we still have to be in Silicon Valley physically to be in Silicon Valley? Or will the world be a little bit different than what it is? We can also carry it forward and talk about the new world. Um, do we, does really, does the United States really need 3000 plus universities? What about when we are moving into this new world of online learning? And let's say maybe we're gonna have only 500 universities, the best in the country, and everyone will be able to get a degree from Stanford, the NYU, uh, uh, UCLA and so on, just by learning online. And what that will impact the university, university cities, residential or student housing and so on. These are all very interesting questions that at this time, nobody has an answer to. So if we move forward. So we talk about potentially at risk industries, okay? So we look at Silicon Valley, the at risk industry composes it composes about 27 of the Silicon Valley workforce. And that is a significant number of people in our area. There is a less clarity implication of pandemic housing market on the long run, whether as we discussed earlier, whether 
uh, whether that what's the implication of this new normal on Silicon Valley real estate on the both residential as well as on the uh, commercial real estate. Okay, and obviously the big variable that is missing in this entire conversation is what really going to happen. You know, there is as we talked before, uh, will uh, will we experience convergence of flu season with the car? COVID-19 in the winter. What will be the implication of relaxing those, uh, you know, uh, social distance on the United States on Silicon Valley? What's the implication? There are significant unknowns that we do not know at this stage, and we cannot speculate on what, how, and how the future going to look like. Some interesting stat is that some Bay Area might escape employment crisis, and that's that's a very actually interesting point, because what we see here, and I want to share with you here, is that Silicon Valley, which is a basically a high tech knowledge based industries, okay, what we see here that in those in those area that we have indicated before, where there is a strong demand for housing. Uh, basically, as a result of uh, empl new employees moving in, we see that in those area. So, what is the percentage of high at risk at high risk uh, residents who live in each one of those cities? So, for instance, in Los Gatos, Saratoga, uh, Cupertino, only one can say only and wow, twenty percent of the population is at risk because of this economical crisis that is knocking on the door. We look at cities like Mountain View, Palo Alto, Los Altos, 21% of those, that population is at high risk of losing their job and so on. And um, if we look, San Francisco is about 33% and East San Jose is 50%. If we're gonna map all those area now to the tier one, tier two and tier three, you're clearly going to see that in East San Jose, the majority of the population is a tier two and two or three people. And if we look at Los Gatos, Mountain View, and so on, these are mostly a tier one employees. So that's very much kind of uh, tells you what the potential impact on those particular cities. Okay, now with a caveat here, it obviously depends how long and how deep that uh, the pandemic, the crisis is going to continue. Obviously, the longer it will continue, the more significant impact it will have on our area. So, uh, what is happening in the real estate market during the COVID-19 period? So, what we see here that number one, it is uh, basically between uh, March and just recently, the entire real estate market was on hold, okay? So that we do not have really a good statistics about what is actually happened. Mostly we have a sort of, uh, and obviously on March 28th, we see some uh, real estate was added to the essential services. So we see some beginning of some uh, uh, transaction and uh, and uh, engagement, but very limited. So what we have basically, we have mostly anecdotal data from our offices, from conversation, from looking at some data. We do not have a good data to tell you exactly what are the long-term trends yet. And particularly when real estate typically, even though when you go into a transaction, it typically these days goes between 25 and 35 plus days. So we always have some lag time on actually telling you accurately what is really the impact of this uh, pandemic. In addition to that, there isn't a single real estate market, okay? There is micro market, there are multiple market segment and they can be basically looked at three, I kind of look at them and to, for a sake of simplicity to some extent, Look at three market, the sub one million market, the one market, the market between one and three million, and the three plus. 
And each one of those market is behaving differently. We're going to touch it a little bit later down the road. But what we also see here, when we look at our area in general, the kind of the area that we kind of, in a sense, touched about being Silicon Valley. So what do we see? Clearly, we see implication. If we compare home listed in March 19, compare to the 220. So obviously, what we see here that there is definitely, you know, a, a, a drop in terms of listing here, the gold, basically the yellow gold, whatever you this is the color, we see almost 50% drop in terms of new listing between comparing to last year to this year. Some of that actually is the COVID-19 and some of them is the fact long time trend that we've seen inventory dropping. If we look at sold listing, obviously, and again, remember, there is always a lag time between the time a property is on the market and it sells. It sells, it takes between 25 to 40 days plus minus to actually sold. So some of that information is basically the sell that happened here actually occurred, occurred here 25 to 30 days before that. If we look at sold here, we see 30% drop here. We see new listing 40% drop, a change in continuum. We see a drop all over the market. TFT is transaction felt out of escrow. Basically, people who actually their offer was accepted, they got cold feet and they decided basically to walk away. So we see here 14%. People who canceled their listing, we see 20%. And people, who, uh, sellers who withdrew their properties of the market, a significant 67% of comp growth compared to the previous year. So clearly, we see an impact on this pandem pandemic because this uncertainty that is taking place in the market. So if we now look, coming from the kind of uh, the Silicon Valley and looking more into our area, this is the San Mateo County. Okay, single family San Mateo country. And what we see, this is from 2018. Typically, it raises up. We look at here at um, this is basically contingent pending. Okay, this uh, this is basically properties are going into contract. So we see the typical seasonality of the market going up in the beginning of the first half of the year and kind of flattening in the summer and going down to the end of the year. We see 19 again going up, flattening, and here we are at 2019, we see that starting the typical start, but immediately it basically being uh, stopped and halted. No, basically the market got frozen. And if we look at the relationship, obviously between sales price and this price, so the typical price going up in the beginning, kind of, and this is the 19, 2019 that we talked before, about when the real estate, the, the interest rate went up and basically the marks, the market basically stopped. See the one year starting, the year starting in the 19 starting kind of was a little bit of increase, but it was a little bit flat and we see a very strong start for 2020. That's what we talked before about the strong uh, backwind uh, uh, of the stock market, interest rate, and low inventory that basically cause prices to fetch higher than asking price. And we see that the same from the Santa Clara County also. This was for Santa Clara County, the same typical behavior we saw before. Uh, okay. And here again, we see increase, but the market is slowing down here. And again, the prices, we see the and 19 prices going up, the last quarter of 18 coming down, the market in 2019 kind of a little bit flat and going up. And again, a very strong start for 2020, which was stopped obviously because of the COVID-19. So that's more locally in Silicon Valley. So here's a summary of the during and um, during, uh, during the COVID-19 summary, my take, okay? Silicon Valley economy is shedding jobs in all three tiers, okay? Three tiers. Many non-essential businesses are on the verge of disappearing for, for good, okay? Very important thing, okay? The entire transaction process is under a lot of stress and challenges. Preparing and viewing listing was almost very extremely difficult. 
Recently, it's getting better because of the relaxation of the uh, shelter in place as real estate is the California Association of Real Estate with the uh, county is uh, relaxing some of those restrictions and make it a little bit easier than it was before. Uh, the lending market, which uh, somebody asked me before, is very unstable and to some extent non-existent. And what we see here that some jumbo loans basically are disappearing of the market. And one of the key issues there uh, is lenders are cons very concerned about something called forbearance. Forbearance is basically uh, the ability of buyers to ask uh, to ask the lender to for at least the first three months to stop making the payment and adding those payments to the back end of the mortgage. So lenders are very concerned about the fact that the moment they're gonna close the loan, the buyer is immediately gonna file for forbearance and they would not get any paid. The problem is even bigger because those many of those lenders are using some service provider to basically serve their loan and they have committed to making those payments. But those, those service providers are basically using bonds to be able to fund those loans. The moment that basically they don't have the bonds and people don't, cannot issue new bonds and the people are fighting for preparedness, basically they freeze the market and they basically put them in a position of bankruptcy. So what we see here that those kind of market are starting to freeze and on top of that, we see that a lot of lenders are constantly changing their lending requirements. For instance, Bank of America in some of our sections, depends on the loan and so on, have increased their down payment to a minimum of 3 million. Bank, uh, Wells Fargo have reduced their uh, uh, maximum loan amount. So we see a lot of changes taking place in our industry and a lot of uh, very restricted about the about how much reserve you need, who gets the loan, and so on. So definitely, the the mortgage lending market has changed quite uh, dramatically. We used to have something in our in Sereno and Compass and other companies that would let, would allow you to borrow money to buy a new home before you sell your. Uh, existing home as well as would lend you money to do some improvement so you can bring the house to the market. Both of those programs were eliminated for now and there was no longer provided because of this uncertainty that is taking place in the market. So we finished the second segment of our presentation. Please go ahead and we have five minutes, actually five minutes to ask questions before Obviously, one more point that I meant uh, failed to mention here. Obviously, uh, un until the COVID-19 is under control, for impact is un is unpredictable. Please go ahead and ask me questions. Questions? Uh, please. We go have ahead. a question here from Joseph. Is the S P one fifty and the S and P reflecting the real economy? Oh, this is an excellent question. There is a, always this question of the, the Main Street versus Wall Street. There is obviously, there is an article actually, I think in the Wall Street Journal today about this question, Wall Street versus Main Street. So of course it does not reflect the real, uh, the, the Main Street economy. Uh, and also uh, what it does because um, uh, the S&P 500 is an index uh, which is impacted now very dramatically from the high tech companies. While we see in the S and P 500, we have hotels, we have hairlines, we have oil companies which are suffering significantly. But so, what you need to do, you cannot look any more on those indexes uh, as a as a reflection of the entire economy. But you have to look at the individual player, individual segment to understand what's going on in the economy. Nevertheless, though, if we look at the, uh, if we don't uh, if we remember that actually the stock market is the anticipation for the future versus the current situation. The, yes, it, there is suffering, there is pain in the local economy, but also the S&V 50 and Wall Street in general 
is picking the winners and losers of the new world. What is the new normal? And they looking at down the road, six, nine uh, months down the road plus, and looking at who will be the winners. And the current winners are clearly in two segments of the market, is in the technology as well as the biotechnology, pharmaceuticals, and so on. So that is kind of as be the best answer I can give. Next question. You can open your microphone. I have microphone. a question for you, yes, Avi. Yes, go yes. ahead. Um, so uh, you were mentioning that the, uh, the impact of uh, coronavirus on jobs and, and how many people are at risk of losing their job, you know, 19% in, in Los Gatos, 50% uh, in East San Jose, et cetera. Um, let's say it was 30%. Uh, a couple of years ago, the big news was that there was some survey that said that 40% of people in California in the Bay Area were unhappy and wished to leave, but couldn't for whatever reason. So if you combine those two things, not to be overly analytical, but you get like 12% of people will lose their jobs and they already wanted to leave anyway. So would you expect <laughs> a, a, an exodus uh, to, to occur in that scenario? Or? Uh, that's an excellent question. Actually, the people who were, uh, and I do track that information in my regular seminars, I talk about how many people are voicing their concern about moving from Silicon Valley. It's an absolute question, but also what's very important when you look at those numbers, double click on those numbers and I can show you statistics, which I don't have right now with me. It will be take a few minutes to find it. I don't want to get a little bit on a tangent, but if you look at the distribution of who are the people who are coming to Silicon Valley versus who are moving to Silicon Valley, you clearly see a very clear trend. People who are coming to Silicon Valley are young, educated and are making a lot of money. And many of them are actually also foreign born. So we have, when we look at that, there are two parameters. There is the immigration, which is typically foreign outside of the USA and migration. Migration is within the United States. So you clearly see a very strong immigration, people from all over the world, basically United States sucking the brain power of the entire world, which is, an, it's, so it's the, the US has two things going for her, for itself. First of all, they can print money, and second, they can bring um, the print money that everyone want, everyone in the world wants, and they are basically sucking the brain power of many places in the world. It was in the past, hopefully, with the a new administration, a new thinking, they can continue bringing those high-skilled, smart people from all over the world to Silicon Valley and continue to be the major power of innovation. Now. If you look at, if we go back to your question, if you look at the distribution of the people who are living, then there are people who are older people and typically less educated and people who are not making a lot of income. So what we are basically seeing here is a major genderification of Silicon Valley. Only the educated, the young, the professionals are, can afford living here those who unfortunately have not participated in this economy have to leave. I hopefully answer your question. Uh, yes, thank you. Other question, please. I have a question for you, Avi. Yes. What does it, um, what does it mean to buyers that lenders are changing their requirements? Uh, when Has this happened in the past or was it Usually after a crash, or is there any kind of um, experience? Is there any kind of event that uh, can shed some light from the past? Uh, number one, it did happen in the past, obviously, and the vendors basically, if you look at the financial crisis, the financial crisis, and I would recommend anyone to look at this, uh, read the book, The Big Short, and they basically describe there how loose and unresponsible lenders and the entire food chain of lending and real estate was back in the, between 2000 and 2007. So, and as a result of that, uh, lenders have changed dramatically their requirements. Okay. And these are the kind of limitation. There's no uh, interest only loans are no longer uh, loans, which are uh, um, in uh, what's called um, uh, enticing loans where they have negative amortization in the, in the beginning and so on. And the requirements have changed dramatically from what's the maximum debt to ratio that you can go up to 43%, how much reserve do you need, uh, that you need at least a certain percentage of down payment. 
So definitely it is change. In addition to that, uh, lenders have basically constantly monitoring the market and they obviously don't want to be stuck with loans that are not performing and they have to do foreclosure and so on. Banks have learned a big, a big very bad lessons of this last, uh, last um, crisis. And the true, honest truth, in the last year or so, we have seen some of those bad practice by the blenders are coming back. I think that this crisis is basically going to reset that kind of uh, tendency and going to be much more restrictive going forward. Last question. Uh, Abby, did I hear you say the B of A has a minimum down payment requirement now of $3 million for a jumbo loan? Uh, did, no, I miss, well, did I mishear you? <laughs> I said that the B of A has a 30% down payment for uh, for loans now. And uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So let's talk about prior crisis impact on Silicon Valley economy and real estate market. So obviously, uh, I cannot say that uh, we're going to have a repetition of the two crises. But the question here is, what can we basically uh, uh, learn from previous crisis, okay? And that is the kind of questions. And I wanna share with you what's, what's basically happened in the past. Okay, so, uh, so we're gonna take two crises, the, dot, the dot com crisis, which basically was a, a Silicon Valley uh, centric epicenter. Silicon Valley was the epicenter of this crisis. Uh, I've lived there, I'm not sure how many of you lived here, but it's definitely was a very interesting time. And we're gonna show you some charts before and so on. Uh, the global financial crisis, which the epicenter was basically the entire US real estate market. And as we saw, it's basically started in uh, 2007 and ended roughly in uh, 2019. So that's basically what I wanna see. And now what I wanna do is I want to tie them to their stock market. And we see the SPY and, and the QQQ, and the QQQ is basically tracking the largest uh, 100 uh, shares of the NASDAQ, which most uh, dominantly are the technology stock. Okay, so what we see here, we see here the first crisis, this was the dot-com crisis, okay? And in the dot-com crisis, we see that this, the general market compared to Silicon Valley drop about 46%, but Silicon Valley stocks and companies dropped their capitalization or by almost 70, 70, almost 77%, a major, major drop in the value of all those Silicon Valley companies compared to the broad market, okay? If we look at the financial crisis, which was, as I mentioned, the epicenter of that was the entire United States, and obviously it has global impact, was that the United, Silicon Valley was still impacted uh, more than the general market, but nevertheless, though, we see that the uh, uh, SPY, uh, interestingly enough, dropped by the same 46% compared to the previous uh, correction. If we look where we are today, then obviously we see the, the big drop and then the correction and where we are in the market. So clearly what you see here is that the, the Silicon Valley market companies were impacted by those two crises. Now let's take a look, how did that impact the real estate market? And we're gonna talk about it in a second. Okay, so in nine, and I'm, I'm highlighting this point here, and that is when the dot-com started, and we're gonna start kind of reviewing that time of history. So this is employment chart, of Silicon Valley, okay? And here is this beginning of the dot-com where we have seen incredible uh, rise uh, in employment. Obviously, the, we saw that this is the uh, December, the Q1 of 2000, when we saw a huge drop in the employment and some, some correction, look at that. It started in 2000 and it took four years for Silicon Valley employment to start heading up, okay? Interestingly enough, we see here that while the United States went into the 2007 financial crisis, 
It took another year for Silicon Valley to go into the financial crisis. So a year later, Silicon Valley went into the financial crisis. And if we look here, is we start the correction of the local economy started here, and here in 2010, actually beginning of uh, beginning of 2010, we saw the incredible uh, run that Silicon Valley has for the last 10 years. So Silicon Valley is enjoying an incredible uh, employment uh, growth in the last 10 years. And we have basically surpassed this number that was predicted back in 2000, uh, 2011. So clearly we see the fluctuation of employment based on where this economy is. Now, if we, as, okay, these are the cold older Zippo that we did. So now let's look at the employment of Silicon Valley by tiers, okay? So we see here that uh, the crisis of uh, dot-com crisis Look which tier was the one that lost the most employees. It was tier two and tier three, okay? While the tier two lost jobs, these are the high uh, quality, high income jobs, we lost jobs, but most of the impact was on tier two and tier three, okay? If we look here, the same repetition. We see tier two is losing most jobs, Tier one, also, and tier two, uh, tier one, a little bit less. Okay, so the actually the big question: What's going to happen here? How are we going to see that? What's going to happen here as a result? I anticipate it, and the first sign that we have actually seen is that this thing's going to repeat itself. Where we see the tier one losing jobs is in the high tech job that we talked about, which are more in the consumer area versus the high tech companies that has a very strong balance sheet. If you look at the top 20 companies we mentioned that are responsible for 85% of the revenue and the majority of employees in Silicon Valley, you clearly see that these companies have the balance sheet to be able to support it. Another factor that I want you to remember that companies are late to hire and late to fire. They are late to hire because they wanna make sure that before they are committing to hiring people, their business is stable and growing, and they are late to fire because they already made a huge investment in hiring and training, and they will be very cautious of before letting those people go. You see that startups have a different mentality and different priorities because they are burning cash, and they are living not on sales necessarily, but they are living on capital infusion from their investors. And as we saw in the past, in the chart, that those capitals are being more restricted. And I know for a fact that a lot of those venture capital-based companies are being pushed by their investor to cut costs and so on and so forth. So definitely when we're gonna see those tier one employees going down, that's gonna be typically in a startup industry and in industries, uh, public companies, industries in uh, which are basically associated with the consumer um, economy. Now, if we look at that crisis, a long-term chart of Silicon Valley, if we look here at the median price, this is the median price, okay, median price. Then if we look at the change in median home price, in the change in price, and obviously as a function also of interest rate. These are factors. So let's take a look at what's happening in Silicon Valley. So we saw that in the late 80s, we came from a, a time of relatively high appreciation we went into a very flat market for very long until the internet was quote unquote invented. And here is the incredible growth that we have seen coming from the dot-com market. Home prices are going up and we obviously see the increase in the, uh, in the uh, market, the home median price, okay? Then we are hit. So what's happening? This is the three, uh, the dot-com crisis is happening here. Interestingly enough, homes continue to go up for some time and only after, even though you remember the gradual change in the employment, it was not, it took about three years for the change in the employment to take place. Nevertheless, though, when we actually saw, this is when Grinchpan lower interest rate. And here we see that actually the correction in Silicon Valley in terms of prices was very narrow and short. 
We see a correction up to 10% plus minus, and obviously it's on the county level, so we see a different mix of things. And then on a, after a very short time, we see immediately an appreciation coming back and a very minor correction. And we are here back again. If you remember the previous chart, uh, 2004, we are basically starting to see an increase in the employment heading toward the um, heading toward basically the financial crisis. So this is what this chart tells us. If we look at the real estate market, and if we look at both uh, what we talked before, this is the this chart is the uh, average median price, and this is inventory level. We we'll see here. So you see here dot com. And you see how many more homes compare to buyers. We see here that here for every buyer we have about five homes for sale. Okay, and obviously what happened here when you have such a uh, such a discrepancy, you see prices dropping. And we're heading to the financial crisis where we have actually almost seven plus homes for every buyer. Obviously, the result is a major drop in the prices. But what we have to look now here is very important. Remember, I said these are giving you overall trends. What we want to see here is double click on those numbers and see what's so very specific to that. So if you look at here, so what we see here that uh, August 2007, the mix of homes below 500 was 6.8%. A year later, August 2008, the homes below the 500,000 point jump almost five folds. In other words, what's happened here, here, which I think might happen in our crisis again, and we saw that already in, you see the people who are at risk of losing their job at East San Jose at about 50%. So what's basically gonna happen in my opinion here is those people who are living in those areas like East San Jose, those areas are, which are more susceptible to uh, the impact of the financial crisis, we're gonna see that happening again and people who live in the more affluent area, which have a much more stronger financial uh, profile, will a be able to sustain this turmoil. And if they do not get the prices they want, they're gonna basically gonna pull the house from the market. Unlike those people who's gonna lose their jobs in those areas that they don't have enough financial debts. And when they lose their job, they don't have a way to continue paying those uh, mortgages. And as a consequence of that, basically they have to foreclose, put the market on the, uh, put the house on the market for sale for any price just to get out of it. So I do suspect that that's my return as well in this cycle. Now, if we look next uh, to the prices that actually drop, we see that actually in the, the bottom of Silicon Valley in California, the prices drop by 58%. In, in Java and in Silicon Valley, it's dropped almost by 50% as well. So we saw a significant drop, but remember, these are average and median prices, which are definitely were impacted by the crisis. So if we look at this area now, uh, let's take another look at this area when we kind of focus on this area here. Okay, and what we see here that this is the number of sale and the supply. So the relationship between supply and demand. And here is basically the demand side. So very interesting. So we saw that the market has uh, cycles. Okay, we saw that. That's the frequency of the market in terms of supply. We also see that demand has uh, cycles. And what we see, if this is the beginning of the year, the demand goes up from the beginning of the year, it picks up tower the summer because what we see here, basically tower the summer in the May, May, June timeframe, schools are uh, going on vacation. Uh, people are start traveling, particularly in our area, we have uh, roughly 60% of the local engineers are foreign born. Many of those engineers are going back to their homes and visiting and going on vacation and so on. So what we see here, is basically demand drops in the middle of the summer and it comes back and it comes back here, okay? When people are coming back from vacation, 
But what we see here in this particular area where we see that there is a discrepancy between demand and supply. So in a typical normal year, that would be, might be a little bit of buying opportunity here, even though that as we discussed before, the prices might be a little bit higher, but you might have a little bit less competition. Unlike previous year, I believe that because of the COVID-19 and because of the shelter in place and the fact that we did not have many homes on the market, I see we're going to see a supply even going higher this coming summer because of all this delay to a transaction from the Q2, Q2 and so on will be basically uh, addressed in this time of the year and that there will be less people going on vacation, more staying home. A lot of the people are going to be concerned about traveling, flying, and so on. So I do anticipate some sort of a more balanced market versus the opportunity that we had in this area and this area when a lot of buyers are on vacation. So a summary of the prior crisis. So Silicon Valley real estate is a derivative of the local economy. And I want you to always remember that, okay? Fluctuation can be correlated directly to the Silicon Valley performance, okay? Silicon Valley economy is resilient, okay? And has a substantial global reach, okay? And typically leads the recovery. That is something which also I want you to remember. Uh, there isn't a single real estate market. There are many micro markets depending on the city, neighborhood, price point, and property profile, condition, uh, so on, so on, etc. The high end and the low end of the real estate market are most vulnerable to the economical crisis, okay? Fluctuation. I'd like to open it up again to another five minutes of Q&A. Yes. The last crisis you described were based on bubbles. Uh, this one is because of the of the of the of the disease. There was also a bubble, probably, but it's because of the disease. So, do we think there'll be really a different way of uh, the different issues with the recovery just because work habits will be will change? Right? We all talk about work habits changing, or people don't work from office, or maybe not all days of the week. Um, do you see, for instance, the East Bay becoming stronger? Just because people can come to work a day, one day a week instead of four uh, or five days a week, um, so they don't mind driving one day, but living in a bigger house uh, far away. Mm -hmm. Well, let's uh, let's unpack your uh, question. So, first of all, I do absolutely agree with you that this crisis is uh, more resembling the the thirties crisis versus the dot com. And the uh, and the financial crisis, the dot com crisis was mostly focused in Silicon Valley. That was the epicenter of the world of the crisis, uh, and the um, crisis in financial crisis was the epicenter was the United States. But it has an impact on the entire world. But nevertheless, though, because nevertheless, though, I do see this crisis as significantly different than the other one and if you and if you look at the Nor and listen to Norielli and Doily and uh, and many other and uh, and Nazim and so on you you definitely hear a, a much more concern tone and if we even look at the magnitude the magnitude of the US layoff is over 33 million people which is an incredible and anyone who believes that all those people are going to come be employed in, uh, in next quarter lives in La La Land. It's going to take some time before people are going to feel confident to travel, to go on an airplane, to go on a restaurant, and so on. It's going to take a while. What I do see is the companies that are going to benefit from uh, basically the new normal is typically the high tech companies which are located in Silicon Valley. As far as the East Bay, and I touched that uh, in terms of uh, the impact on the new normal of Silicon Valley. Uh, I mean, look at the San Jose, downtown San Jose, Google Village, at the Facebook uh, Willow Village, and all those companies who are purchasing a ton of stuff. And if you followed that, uh, Google basically said that until maybe 20 next year, they are expecting more of their people to work from home. 
it's going to have an impact on commercial real estate, no question. And if companies will allow people to work, let's say two days or three days from from home and three days at work, what's the implication of that? Both in commercial real estate and residential real estate and so on. These are questions that I don't have an answer yet, but definitely something that I'm thinking about, as well as I indicated earlier about what's the impact on hotels, what's the impact on student housing, on universities. So this new world is a big unknown to me right now, but these are kind of questions that cross my mind. What, uh, what to expect of post COVID-19 impact on Silicon Valley? Okay, let's, let's talk about that. So again, I'm always gonna leave leave lead with the economy okay as i said multiple times the economy is the leading indicator uh, it's not very clear what is this new normal okay what is this normal we touched before and when will it resume this is definitely not clear what's going to happen and i want to emphasize that the i believe i don't have any crystal ball okay i don't want to come as someone who can tell you what the future will be. I don't know, but that is what I believe will happen. Okay, Silicon Valley economy will continue to be adversely impacted by the global slowdown. And it's a global slowdown. It's not only US, okay? Resulting in layoffs, furloughs, and pay cuts, both in the innovation industry and more substantially in the support non-essential. And I put it at non-essentials, in quotes, because uh, police is essential, rest, uh, food is essential, teachers are essential, but these are co considered as quote unquote non essential industry. Okay. Silicon Valley economy will most probably recover first in the nation and benefit from reliance on technology in the future. If we can look at the future, the future has a lot of technology. And it's not only web, uh, uh, you know, uh, to companies like Facebook and Google and so on. We have the electric cars. We have a lot of biotech companies here. We have a, a lot of very diverse industries located here. And the reason that it, they are located here is because we have the capital, we have the brain power, and we have the uh, basically the employees and the, all the infrastructure that allows those industries to flourish in our area. Okay. Uh, and but at the same time, as we touched before, uh, many believe that the, uh, we are heading to a worse than the financial crisis, recession, depression. Ray Dalio, Nourage, uh, Jeremy, and others that I'm following very closely. And I want to actually emphasize because I didn't know, I did not have to know until recently what is the difference between a recession and depression. So I want to kind of make sure that we are on the same page. What is the difference between a recession and depression? A recession is a gradual decline. Our economy did not have a gradual decline. We have a dramatic decline, okay? Uh, to the economy that occurs over six months. No, it happened very, very fast. So this is a recession. So what is a depression? An extended recession, serious decline in the economy. Okay, we had a serious decline. Last for years, this is didn't, it's not yet, obviously it just started. So it, it, it does lack the fact that it lasts for years, okay? Uh, for depression to be in effect, unemployment rates have to raise above 20%. As of 5.8 this, uh, this um, last week, we're at 14.7. So we are not technically in the, in the recession yet. And significant decline in gross domestic income. Yes, we are absolutely severe decline in domestic product. Okay. So clearly we see signs of depression, but for that to really become depression, it to be extended for years and it has to, the unemployment level can have to reach over 20%. We're not very far from there, but we're not there yet. And hopefully we'll not get there, but we'll see. Uh, what to expect of, on the real estate market? Uh, so if we're looking at, if we're asking the question of real estate market, there is not a single market, okay? The, each segment has its own uh, sub-market. And I wanna, and I'm drawing between three markets, one up to $1 million, $1 million to $3 million, and $3 million and above. So in the low end market up to 
uh, up to uh, one million uh, dollar market, mostly in the service economy, tier two workforce, tight budget and limited uh, reserve, okay, will be hit the hardest from contraction in Silicon Valley economy. In the mid-range market, one million to three market, it actually should have been tier, tier two and tier three a market, not only tier one. In the mid-range of one million to three million market, it's mostly in the professional economy, the tier one workforce, high income and broad reserve will be hit the least in contraction of the Silicon Valley economy. It's in my opinion, will be hit the least of the market. In the high end market, mostly seen the high end tier one market, these are uh, basically people who are in, the, in those kind of company on the very high uh, kind of director, VP, CEO, and so on, very high level, very high income, uh, high income and broad reserve and, and stock portfolio, okay? And I do believe that those will be hit, but not as badly as, as other uh, segments of the market. So we have to look at markets, not in a homogeneous way, but we have to look at it in each tier uh, separately, and more specifically in the particular market that you are interested in. So where do I see are the buyer's opportunities? Okay. Properties that are long day on the market, okay, that are staying on the market for long term. Properties that TFT is transaction felt through. Basically, those people or homes that were went pending, supposedly sold, and the buyers, for whatever reason, changed their mind, and the property is back on the market. It's basically translate to motivated sellers. Okay, motivated sellers. Limited opportunities are on properties which are short days on the market, just came on the market. Sellers are very optimistic. Okay, they're not really open for negotiation. They are basically believe they have a, they're selling a jewel and there is probably a, a pent up the interest in the property. Good location, good condition. When properties are in this good location, good condition, you most typically gonna attract more competition. And obviously what is important for you is to focus on the market. Don't be all over the place. Study the, the areas they wanna focus on, be comfortable with those area, make, make sure you understand what's happening in the market segment that you are interested in. That leads me to my recommendation for buyers, okay? Buy your Silicon Valley home if your Silicon Valley index, Silicon Valley F index is in an appreciating trend. Again, the Silicon Valley economy is the, is the most important factor impacting real estate prices. Make sure that before you jump into the market, the trend, the Silicon Valley uh, companies are do, performing uh, relatively well and you basically don't, are not uh, kind of trying to uh, uh, catch a falling knife, okay? Your six to 18 months point of view of the local economy is relatively positive, okay? Which is basically ties to the, ne to the previous uh, point, okay? You are really relatively confident with your job. The fact that Silicon Valley economy in general is doing well, doesn't mean that your job is secure, okay? Silicon Valley is your home for at least the next three to five years. You are not here to just flip or, uh, or buy a house and sell it next year because you think that the appreciation is going to happen. Not clear it's going to happen. Not clear if the um, people or property is going to lose property. So you have to have at least next three to five years stay in Silicon Valley. And that is your home. Okay. You have the down payment and the reserve. Okay, down payment, the reserve. Don't over leverage yourself. Okay, you have to be make sure that you have enough down payment and reserve for situation that are foreseen. Okay, you can make the monthly payment while maintaining a reasonably quality of life. I do not believe that you should be a slave to your home. You should be able to buy a home and live comfortably and make sure that you can still 
take your children to movies, park, restaurants and every, every once in a while, go on vacation and live life. You obviously have to balance living the moment and living the future, but don't become a slave to your home. You have researched the target market areas where you are interested. Make sure you know what you're looking for. Make sure you're comfortable with the area you want to go into. And make sure that you identify a realtor you can trust, okay? Um, a lot of, I, I hear many times there are people who compare realtors to a used car salesperson. Yes, there are those people. So make sure you find a realtor you can trust that they're going to give you the information that you are need to make good decision. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Honest with you, serving your needs. Your priorities is their priorities. They are not running their business based on their need, but based on what you need to know and making sure that your needs are being addressed, being listened to. That is key. Realtor, you trust, okay? Uh, whatever decision you're gonna make, it has consequence, okay? So you have to ask yourself, if you now live in Sunnyvale and you pay somewhere between maybe $5,000 to $6,000 a month on rent, it's gonna be about fifty dollars to $60,000 a year. If you think that you wanna wait three to five years, it's, uh, it can be two hundred fifty dollars to $350,000 of guaranteed loss. If you believe that market gonna correct over more than 250 to 350, stay. If you don't believe so, jump. If you wanna take the chance, consider buying one. But whatever decision you are making, it has consequence. What option is, what option makes sense for you and your family? This is your decision. What are you comfortable with? And obviously, uh, buying a home in Silicon Valley is for those who believe in the future, are optimistic about how Silicon Valley is going to turn out. That is a very critical thing. Do you have a positive outlook about our Silicon Valley economy, about your job, about living in the area? If you do not, obviously, you shouldn't buy a home in Silicon Valley. Now, my recommendation to seller, sell your Silicon Valley home or rental property if... Silicon Valley index is in an appreciating trend and you must sell, must sell, okay? Can you wait for shelter in place to be over? Make sure to follow the SIP guidelines, okay? Can you wait a little bit, okay? Find a realtor you can trust, the same, the same story, making sure, make sure you are partnering with people that your best interests are in their heart and they're in their mind, okay? And prep the house to impress and price it attractively. Make sure that you are taking the time to think about the people who are gonna buy the house. Clean it, prepare it, market it, and price it in a way that they're gonna generate traffic to, make, uh, to have interest in the property, okay? Else, if the Silicon Valley is in the depreciating trend, okay, and you and trend, and you have time, okay, and you have time. Hold for better times, or rent the house for at least two and a half years. And the reason I say why is because, and there is a law IRC one twenty one that will allow you to benefit from up to five hundred dollars capital gains if you sell the property within three years. So I put two and a half because the sales cycle might take, the prep and the sales cycle might take about uh, six months. So, so don't wait over two and a half years before because you're going to lose your $500,000 a couple of gain exemption. Okay. Uh, consider also refinancing your, uh, your home uh, and for lower payment. And if you do need some cash, just refinance it and make sure that you can basically uh, have enough capital to be able to go through this period. So what is the next step? Schedule a follow-up meeting to evaluate your personal situation regarding Silicon Valley real estate or nationwide investment. Again, I wanna remind you, we're gonna have an investment seminar next Sunday. Please participate in that. If you, have, if you wanna talk to us personally, we can do a Zoom meeting, a follow-up meeting, or a telephone meeting and address your question directly and making sure that we are answering your questions. Uh, if you are not already part of a monthly report, basically uh, we will be happy to 
uh, add you to our mailing where we're going to update you on a regular basis what's happening in the market about uh, our seminars, whether it's for investor, buyers, sellers, and so on. And obviously, I want to wish you, uh, you and your family, extended, uh, healthy, and happy shelter in place. And thank you very much for your time. We're going to open it up for questions, and I'm going to stick around as long as you want to ask questions. So go ahead and ask any question you want. It's based on your presentation, it's very clear that uh, this is not a good time for real estate investment. We need to wait and watch what's happening to the market. Are you talking about investing or are you talking about investing for as a for rental property or are you talking about owner occupied? Uh, rental properties. Okay, excellent question. Uh, we are basically managing right now roughly about 300 homes across the country. Okay. And uh, we are basically our current investment. We have two investments which are supposed to close in about 10 days or so. And we had uh, two other investments that we were supposed to close about uh, two weeks ago. We can sell those investment. And we are right now uh, basically trying to renegotiate the purchase price. Uh, I believe that 30 plus millions of people who are losing their job going to have a major impact on the rental market. Okay. Now, I just forwarded to my team uh, an interview with uh, regarding um, uh, Airbnb uh, owners and basically how dramatically that impact their market and how many of those Airbnb owners are basically starting to look to sell their properties before they're being foreclosed. I believe that the 33 million people who currently are benefiting from a very lucrative unemployment and the checks that the government have provided, they're going to have issues with being able first to purchase and also pay rent. So my recommendation in general is wait. We have not seen enough blood in the street. It's going to take two to three months before we're going to have to start seeing the blood in the streets. And you're going to start seeing a lot of those developers basically losing their clients who are basically our competition and they would not be able to pay their lenders and so on. And we're going to see, in my opinion, uh, uh, some uh, similar situation that we have experienced back in financial crisis where we buying homes at values which are basically the fair market value was substantially below the replacement cost. And we have been buying in the area of Atlanta and Arizona properties that for $120,000, $140,000 that the insurance company forced us to have insurance over hundred eighty two hundred thousand dollars because the cost of replacement was significantly higher than the cost of the fair market value so the other bottom line answer to you i believe we should hold monitor the market which we do basically and that's what the kind of services that we provide our client and basically by monitoring the market we will basically look for the right time to enter the market and continue buying properties for those properties in addition to that, we, even though we, uh, so I spoke to my Tennessee property management yesterday. Uh, for, the, uh, for the month of April, we had a very good um, uh, payment, a rental payment. We are not as optimistic about May payment and June payment, but we'll see what's happening. So not only that I expect that um, price is going to drop, I also see some risk about getting into the market because renters would not be able to pay their rent as in the past. Hopefully I answer your question. Thank you. Thank you for detailed uh, answer. Next Harvey, we have a question from Sylvia. Mm -hmm. What was the real estate market data for April 2020 in Santa Clara County? What was the percent down or up in price? In, in, in April, uh, it's, it's anecdotal data. April was still a month of restrictive shelter and in place rules, which did not allow 
uh, a lot of showings and participation and so on. Uh, and I do not can I cannot tell you in confidence, statistically confident that we see a trend. But in general, I can tell you we went to two transactions in April. Uh, both of them were in the 1.1 million to 1.45 million. And one case we would manage to get the house uh, for about sixty thousand dollars below asking uh, uh, price, and the other we went almost seventy thousand dollars over asking price. So there isn't yet a good indication. I hear from our colleagues that they are experiencing similar thing, but it's very much anecdotal. We don't have yet a firm, and even in the in the April sales, these are sales that happened a month before in the april sales and the, i'm sorry in the april close properties that close in the months of april these are sales that happened 30 days before uh, sales that happen in during the months of april we're going to see the numbers in mid may to late may next there is also a follow up from sylvia um what about the next 6 months uh, is there an approximation of any uh, expectations Again, follow the economy. That's my only advice I can give you. If we're going to see major layoffs taking place in Silicon Valley, uh, we're going to see an impact on the real estate market. So follow the trend of what's happening with those large companies. I definitely believe that the startup companies were going to be hit hard, and we already see that. But the question, the big question is, what will do the big companies, the publicly traded companies, the top 20 companies, uh, headquarters in Silicon Valley, as well as companies like Microsoft, Amazon, and, and Samsung and others, which are not necessarily headquarters in Silicon Valley, but have a strong uh, employment uh, footprint locally. I have a question now. Question around uh, the folks who are actually buying the house for the first time for the new buyer home. Uh, buyers, uh, the people who are actually staying on rent, we have seen a trend actually go down. The rents are going down. Mm -hmm. I recommend uh, for folks to just stay on rent, uh, especially who are paying lesser rents right now, and just wait it out and then see how the market is behaving before they go and buy a home. Is, is this a question or a statement? It's, it's a question. Well, obviously, I think you have. Um, I agree with you that the rental market, which was crazy in Silicon Valley, and I can show you stat that people would pay uh, in, uh, for, uh, particularly in some of those new development, they would pay for one bedroom, like $3,000, $4,000 uh, a month, which is a crazy numbers. So I hope that the rental market will go down in terms, of, and um, if you don't have, yes, uh, if it's actually, the prices of rent going down here locally, you have less of a pressure maybe to look for a house. But also, if you are a, you see, go back to my recommendation. If you're planning to stay in Silicon Valley for the long term, you have the capital, and you, you, have, a, you have securing your job and so on, it might be also a buying opportunity as well. It's the fact that renting going down maybe takes a little bit away from the pressure, gives you a little bit more time, but don't miss that opportunity. I've seen enough people who basically were waiting for years and lost the opportunity. You cannot pick the bottom, you cannot pick the top. Make sure that you make a decision when you find something you like, okay? And you can basically, if you follow the recommendation that I put down there, and you're comfortable in your job, you are not becoming a slave to it, and you stay in Silicon Valley, and you cannot optimize it because if you're gonna buy for the long term, I don't know of anyone in Silicon Valley, to the best of my honest knowledge, that ever lost money in real estate. And if they are, there are probably very few, and it depends on the timing of when they bought and when they sell, must sell, okay? Even if you're leaving Silicon Valley, you always can continue renting the, mar the house and wait for a better time if that's not a great time to sell right now. Next question. Hi, question from Chris. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, do you expect uh, in the aftermath of um, uh, Corona that the federal rate decisions might uh, add new uh, 
benefits for first time buyers on exclusions or some sort of stimulus that might uh, lower rates or um, you know provide some incentive for uh, for buyers? The answer is I don't know, but what you are actually asking is something in during the financial crisis. As part of the incentive, there was an incentive for new first time buyer. There was an incentive made for first time buyer. It's possible that it's going to come back. I don't know, but uh, we'll see. Next, there's a question here regarding uh, would you recommend if uh, you were going to stay? Would you recommend buying if you were to four to five years? If you are not sure you're going to stay in Silicon Valley for at least three to five years, don't buy uh, because it's too risky. Uh, if but if you are not sure about it, there is always an option that if you buy but you don't have to sell. So if you stay for Silicon Valley for three, at least three to five years, and even if you're going to leave Silicon Valley and you do not have to sell, then yes. But if you're sure you're going to have to sell, then I would say I'll be very careful about it. Okay. And then, has the inventory for single-family homes changed substantially? Of course, uh, it changed substantially. But I do expect a lot of inventory to come back. This month and next month. Okay, so all this pent demand, pent supply that was basically suppressed since basically March time frame, I believe will be added to the typical sale uh, that is happening in the summer. And we're going to see relatively higher inventory level that we have seen if it would be a normal year. And on top of that, on the demand side, because a lot of people would not be traveling. This year, we're going to see also a higher demand in my belief. Next. Question. We have a question here from Joseph. What is your opinion about San Jose downtown condo market? Uh, I love downtown San Jose. I hate condos uh, because uh, condos have HOA. And uh, it's uh, expensive, restrictive, and it doesn't have an upside uh, because once of the one of the things that I like in owning a single family home is the upside that you have with improvement and extension, which is not available when you have an HOA uh, uh, guiding you. But on the flip side of that, if you cannot if I buy a single family home or you don't want a garden or whatever, whatever and you don't buy it from and you buy it primarily as a as a resident solution versus also as a uh, potential appreciation then it's an okay because for instance let me give you an example i know that a single family home in palo alto costs somewhere between 2 and a half to 3 and a half million dollar kind of the entry level of the market and and if you are if it being in the sun in the Palo Alto school district is critical for you, but you cannot afford two and a half to three and a half million dollar, so buy a condominium townhome. At least you will be able to participate and send your school or your kids to the to the local schools. But there are restrictions, so it depends on what are the things that are important to you. What are the factors that are impacting your decision? Next, that's, that's the uh, end of all the chat questions. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Uh, please uh, send us in the chat your email address so we can uh, send you the uh, URL to the presentation. I also would appreciate very much so if you uh, can spend five minutes and uh, write a review on Yelp, LinkedIn, or Google. And um, I would really appreciate that. And um, and we, the urban group is here to help you resolve those questions and guide you through the maze of uh, buying a home in Silicon Valley, selling a home in Silicon Valley and investing in income producing properties across the country. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Make sure you stay healthy and happy and all the best. Any other question or stuff? I see some question coming up. Anything else? Uh, something, something real quick, Avi. Um... I realize you're quite invested in other areas of the country, uh, and you've been focusing on the valley in this prezo. But um, any thoughts about uh, you know um, those local uh, markets 
outside of the valley? Absolutely. And I would like to encourage you to come to our uh, presentation uh, next Sunday, where there is a segment which are basically addressing investing in Silicon Valley real estate. Okay. Uh, just to be, uh, just to give you a little bit more detailed answer for years, I have not invested in Silicon Valley real, uh, income producing properties, but about 3 years ago, plus we started uh, going back to investing in Silicon Valley uh, for income producing properties. And in our presentation next Sunday, I'm giving about 10 reasons why to invest. If not more, what are the reasons that I've changed my mind and what are the consideration that I uh, suggest you look into if they're applicable to you to make sure that you want to go back into investing in Silicon Valley real estate as an investor versus owner or occupied. Uh, how do we register for the next Sunday webinar? Uh, it's, it's, uh, on the it's on the website and we're going to also send you an invitation as well. Got it. Thanks. Yeah, we, this is Prabhu. Uh, do you have any seminars on uh, out-of-state real estate investment? Out-of-state? Yes. So the the presentation next Sunday uh, will be about introduction to real estate investing in general, and we have segments that are addressing investing in Silicon Valley as well as outside of Silicon Valley. We talk about both areas outside of Silicon Valley and in. A matter of fact, the majority of our holding, we are basically uh, what we call second level property management. We are, most of them are outside of Silicon Valley. In the recent year, we purchased, in, I think, something like 13, 14, uh, or 15 homes as investment properties in Silicon Valley. That is the trend that I was re referring to. And that basically depends on what are your investment object objective which we discussed in this uh, uh, presentation. Okay, thanks, Avi. Last question. Um, do you expect um, this time around would be worse than 2008? Uh, there are, uh, there is a lot of belief that the current crisis is much more significant than the one that we had in financial crisis 2007 and 2001 uh, because its implication is much more severe and it's globally versus the two other one which were much more narrower at the same time i don't know the answer to that okay it's a belief okay at the same time, I also believe that Silicon Valley will be the big beneficiary of the new normal. Okay, that's these are the two beliefs that I have. What will actually happen in the future, I do not know, but this is the belief that I am uh, operating under. And what I also am doing, I'm not married to this belief. I am constantly monitoring the market and trying to understand what's going on and change my opinion or my action based on the reality. Was that a okay answer? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, many, many thanks for your time. If you have the time, please write some uh, reviews. I would appreciate that. Please be in touch. Send us your email uh, so we can send you the URL and some other material. Wishing you a healthy and happy shelter in place and good fortune in the future. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. Mm -hmm.